Aloha. Welcome to American's Issues, Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is, Would Trump Finish Out a Second Term? What Comes Next? Uh, with the poll results showing us that it's really a, a dead heat, it's a 50-50 tie between Vice President Harris and Donald Trump, uh, we have to think seriously that there is a 50-50 chance that Donald Trump will become our 47th second term president. Uh, you're going to have to tell me how that's possible with all his outlandish comments that he's been making of the last few weeks. Um, the bottom line is, here are some of the things he's said. And, and I keep scratching my head to say, how is this possible? But there again, here we are, 50-50 in the poll results right now. Uh, he said that, you know, there's murderous DNA in the nature of immigrants that are coming into this country. Uh, he's saying that uh, he is the protector of rights, although he's been found guilty of uh, sexual assault, rape, if you want to call it that, uh, that the Haitians are eating the dogs, the cats, and the pets in Springfield, Ohio, that uh, golfer Owner Palmer has um, enormous genitalia, that Democrats are the enemy of the people, and they're the enemy within, and last but not least, um, his desire to have all his generals to be more like Hitler's generals, Adolf Hitler. Imagine that. So we're going to discuss that this, uh, this, this today. And I have with me my esteemed guests. Uh, we have Ben Davis, uh, Emeritus Professor of Toledo University, uh, law professor. And of course, Chuck Crumpton, our esteemed guest and uh, mediator extraordinaire. And of <laughs> always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Jay, to you first. Uh, to go down the list one more time because there's there's other special little goodies in here, and I need you to to comment specifically with these comments in mind to the question, and that is, we just heard Donald Trump say that the enemy within specifically is Adam Schiff, he calls him Shifty Shift, and Nancy Pelosi. So he wasn't talking about you know a foreign country, he wasn't talking about uh, anyone but the Democrats. Uh, he called Vice President Harris that he, uh, he called her a shit vice president at one of his rallies. He said that he wished again that the generals would be more like Hitler's generals that he had around him. He, um, he has been quoted, and I, this story yet to be flushed out, but when it concerns the, um, the death of a, a veteran by a fellow veteran, that uh, he wasn't gonna pay $60,000 to bury a effing Mexican. Uh, that, uh, again, they're eating dogs and cats in, in Springfield, Ohio, and that uh, the January 6th insurrection was a day of peace. Now, I, I, here's a question, Jay. Are these statements from a man who's unraveling before our very eyes? Or, or are these statements from a man who could care less what he says, and he knows that he is just going to say as he wishes, <laughs> when he wishes, and it won't make one bit of difference to sway his voters uh, any other way. You haven't mentioned the fact that he rambles, which I think is really important. These Only outrageous a remarks. Show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the rambling thing, I think, is, is really undermining um, the way people think about him because he can't hold a thought. And they can laugh and clap and what have you, you know, it, when he calls for it uh, on an emotional level. But but in their hearts, they know that this is not this is not something presidential. So my my feeling is um, that those those crazy comments, together with the rambling, together with the fact that he does not address the issues, um, will cost him a lot of voters. And um, you know, I, I go with Chuck's point that he made some time ago um, about what happens in the voting booth. I think a lot of people who have been sworn to, who have sworn to uh, support Trump, they get into the voting booth and they're just not going to be able to vote for a guy that says crazy things like that, including things against their own interest, their own community. <clears throat> they're going to have a hard time doing that. Uh, and then the rambling thing. I, I hope the press covers that in greater detail. The rambling thing is really really well, did, an example did, of, of the un, the unwinding for him. Well, didn't but I have Trump one other that? point. Let me just interrupt for a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt, but didn't Trump 
address that specifically by saying it's a planned strategy? He calls it the weave. Yeah. Wow. It's obvious to him that he's rambling and he's doing something to try to defend himself on that. He always does. He always doubles down. You know, it's the Roy Cohn approach. He always doubles down, even if he's dead wrong. But I, I want to add one other thing, you know. So I think a lot of people are going to be leaving him because of what you described and because of the rambling and the irrationality and, and his failure in the debate with uh, Kamala Harris. <clears throat> but there's something else. He is counting, you know, on an insurrection. He is counting on the crazy proud boy thing and the ones who, you know, are, are going to do violence, the ones who are going to do illegal things around voting suppression. He's counting on them. And the question is, not only will people vote for him, but will those people who he is counting on do what he wants them to do? And I think what you described and the rambling and the, you know, the general fragmentation of his presentations, the, you know, the, and all the remarks made by all the people who have been around him that he is unfit to serve, those things, and the possibility of prosecution, as you mentioned, Tim, those things are going to eat away the, the base that he has, that he's hoping will do violence or illegal activity on his behalf. And that is a very important process. And I think that's in, in process right now. All right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, ben, this morning, uh, Vice President Harris took to the airways and she specifically addressed these recent comments from Donald Trump, uh, saying on no certain terms that Donald Trump is increasingly unhinged and, and unstable. And she is bringing up the prospect that this guy is going to be, or potentially could be, your next president. Um, is, that a, is, that, is that a strategy that helps right now in the next two weeks? Or should she just focus on what Hillary, or excuse me, Michelle Obama would say is, when they go low, we go high and focus on the economy and, and, and immigration, the two things that uh, are cited uh, as importance in the swing states. So I, I think that there's kind of a two prong strategy that she's using, and I think it's effective. On the one hand, she's trying to convince people to vote for her. And one of the things that she has going for her, as Biden had going for him, even though they tried to set it up with Hunter Biden, is this, there's really no big dirt on her, right? I mean, there's no, like Hillary had the whole sort of, they could play all that stuff about uh, 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 emails and all that stuff and all that, but they've got nothing. They've got nothing on Kamala Harris except uh, denying that she worked at McDonald's. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just nothing, right? So she, uh, and so she uh, struck me particularly as having shown herself most recently in response to these kind of comments that he's made by saying that he demeans the office, she sounded to me very presidential at that moment. I, I mean, there's other things, but it, it really struck me when she said, you know, this guy demeans the office and we, we venerate anyway, in terms of the person, people for our kids to look up to, all that stuff. She plays into that part of us. So that's the vote for me part. And that on the same time, there's like, I'm not Trump and he's crazy, right? And I think that she has to put that forward for particularly people worried about national security and all that, uh, because I think that that is uh, the effective strategy, not one or the other. I do notice that sometimes the commentators say that she's doing one and not the other or doing the other and not the one, right? But I think that she's actually doing both and it's a very disciplined team. Um, the other thing that I would just um, maybe say is that the, the only card that Trump is playing is basically a fear card. I've listened to people who clearly have some fear about there being an insurrection, about what he's going to do, you know, the, the sort of the crazy person thing, right? And so uh, using my great Yiddish, I'm going to say he's a putz. Okay, and he's a shlemiel. Okay, that's all he is. And so he's trying to get us all upset, right? I don't know if that'll get through the censors, but anyway, the, the point is that's all he is. And 
he's, you know, it's like kind of puffing himself up to make everybody feel fearful about him. But what I do know is that if he does anything in the streets with people that are like these proud boys and all that, I know what's going to happen, which is that Biden's going to shut him down because he is not Trump. Biden will shut him down. People will be arrested and they'll go to jail. And guess what? That will stop very quickly because people are going to realize that, that, you know, they're being played one more time. My line to everybody who's out there is basically to just say to them, don't be played for a chump by these people. Don't be played for a chump by Trump because all he's doing is trying to make people think that he really cares about. And the only people he cares about is himself and other billionaires. So okay. I think she's doing a good job of getting that across. And I think also, by the way, putting his words up at her, at her events where people can hear him say the horrible things that you, you just, just described, I think that's very effective to, pe- uh, to the people in the room. Finally, yeah, it's the, old, uh, it's the old meet the press style of interviewing. Yeah. Right. And I, I would just add one other thing is that, you know, the, the wild, quote unquote, crowds at Trump events right behind him. I'm just the kind of guy who's going to say, I wonder how many of those people are paid to be there. That's what he did when he came down the stairs the first time in 2015. Those are all actors paid to be enthusiastic. Right. And I look at it. And I, and, I mean, I'm sure there are all these people who love Trump. I'm not saying they don't. But I wonder how many of those people who are supposed to be sort of enthusiastic are just being paid to do it. Because he's, he's a lot of that kind of stuff, sort of Potemkin, uh, Potemkin um, campaigning. But Yeah. You know, before I go to Chuck, I just uh, before the show started, you and I were discussing Liz Cheney. And for the first time, I've heard someone say, um, you don't have to vote for Trump. You can vote for Harris and uh, no one's going to be the wiser of it. What you do is you do in secrecy. And that's the first time I've heard a politician say that. And I thought yeah. it was uh, wise of Liz Cheney to do so. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, Chuck, does Trump start off with a, you know, his statement uh, it, that he's spoken in the past? If, if he's elected, does he start off his, his second term with, I am your retribution? Does he start a campaign of retribution as he's promised? And as he uh, has spoken many times, or or was that just Trump bluster and he really doesn't mean it, as all his followers and acolytes would say, uh, that's Donald Trump. He doesn't mean any of that. Your thoughts? What planet have you been on <laughs> for the last eight years? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, look what he's done to his own people. And look what dozens and dozens and dozens of his own people, up to the heads of his military, his intelligence, his joint chiefs of staff, everybody. They're saying, this guy is unfit, he's unsafe, he's a fascist. And I think Jay nailed it because Trump has taken the risk of trying to use fear as his sole one trick pony tactic to win this election. But the problem is, that with his visible deterioration and its undeniability, because it's so visible, it's so pronounced, and it's so repeated every single day, fear of him is now being the greatest. One of the best moments of Kamala Harris's acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention was, imagine you're waking up November 6th, And the person with the button, the person with the control over our lives, the person with control over our health, our safety, our foreign relations, everything. What if it's him? And there was dead silence in the room. That's fear. And when you go into the voting booth, that fear and the one that Trump's been trying to play on, people aren't afraid of immigrants. They may be resentful that they think that immigrants are getting more than their fair share of welfare or jobs or government safety nets or something like that. But on a day-to-day basis, that's not a daily fear. But Trump, on the other hand, the stuff he's threatening is daily stuff. And so I think the answer to your question is a resounding 
capital Y, capital E, capital S, with an exclamation point, he absolutely is going to do everything in his power to exploit his ability to literally exterminate all of the people he feel are his enemies. He's not going to stop where he did in his first administration and just saying, you're fired to this general or this administrator or this cabinet member. He's going to say to his legions, fire on them. Mm. Beat them up. He's saying that on a daily basis. Take this lady out and beat the out of her. Mm. He literally says that stuff. How can any sentient being conceive of giving this person responsibility over anything, much less the presidency? He is indecent. He is irresponsible. He is out of control. He's mentally unstable. And he is, as the great line from Jesus Christ Superstar put it, he is dangerous. Okay, thank you, Chuck. For our own sake. Jay, uh, there's only two weeks left before Election Day. And I'm reminded, uh, years ago, I met uh, Governor of Louisiana, Edwin Edwards. I met him at the airport, and we had a nice, long discussion. And I remember further, earlier in his uh, political days, that he said, there's only one way I lose this election. Either I'm found in bed with a dead girl or a live boy, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's, a, that's a direct quote. And it kind of reminds me of when Donald Trump said in his 2016 campaign or 15 campaign that I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and I won't lose any voters. Is there anything Donald Trump could say between now and two weeks from now on Election Day that would switch voters from saying, I can no longer support him, he's over, he's crossed a line, he's over the top, uh, I'm switching my vote. Is there anything Donald Trump could say to cause that kind of reaction? You mean beyond what he's said already? Beyond yes. the kinds yes. of outrageous <laughs> remarks he makes every day? Uh, I, I can't imagine that. I think he'll just keep on making outrageous remarks, and they'll be in the same genre as all the outrageous remarks that he's been making. Uh, they may be a little more outrageous, um, but it may not change the calculus for those who are wedded to him. But I want to add one other point. <clears throat> you know, Mark Milley called him a fascist. Kelly called him a fascist. Uh, this morning, um, uh, Tim Snyder of Yale went on and on with a uh, recorded video calling him a fascist and explaining why he characterizes him as a fascist. And in a word or two, what he was saying and what he has said before and what he has written about before is a fascist creates false problems, false fears that are not real. And, and then he gets people to believe in him that he's going to resolve and solve the fear whatever the problem he defines, and then he doesn't do anything. And when it comes clear that he is not going to do anything, that it was a false fear, then he starts the next false fear. And that's exactly uh, you know, what, what Trump has been doing. He hasn't really solved any problems that are real, just his own false ones. The other thing I want to mention is that there's a series on uh, Netflix now called Who Was Hitler? And it, it gives you a, a very detailed discussion of how Hitler grew up. In, in, uh, in, he was born in 1889. And as he grew up, he failed in everything, including painting and school and family. Everything was a wreck. And then he wound up in jail um, and all that. And somehow, from that low point, he managed to control Germany and was the most powerful man in Europe in the 20th century. Incredible how he did that. And it's this kind of thing. It's the fascist, phony fear. That's exactly what he did. So when Tim Snyder talks about it, and Millie talks about it, and Kelly and innumerable other people are talking about his fascist, and, oh, and his, his niece, is it, you know, um, Mary Trump? You know? Um, they're all talking about it. They all have him nailed on that. Now, I don't know if the people in the red states understand this, but hopefully in the next two weeks, two weeks from yesterday, uh, 
um, they will begin to understand what it means to be a fascist and your term, how he has played the country and his cult um, using these fascistic techniques and how that will injure them, their families, their communities, the country and the world, uh, just as Hitler did. He was very dedicated to Hitler. He did keep a copy of Mein Kampf on his bedstand. He did read and quote for, from it. Um, so this is a guy who is capable of madness, madness. And, and I don't know if the public understands that. And worse yet, Tim and Ben and Chuck, I don't know if the press understands that. They're sane washing him. He goes on for 90 minutes of ramble, and they quote the rational, the one rational cogent statement he may make, and they don't tell us that the rest of it was madness. So <clears throat> I hope they change that. The other thing I would like to ask all of you is in Trump's madness, what does he have in mind if he is unable to actually perform the duties of his office? He's not going to be thrown out on, on the basis of the 25th Amendment because that requires a vote of his cabinet and his cabinet will all be acolytes. The question is, um, what does he think is going to happen in terms of a succession plan? Is it just J.D. Vance or is it his son? Because his son is stepping up and collaborating with J.D. Vance. And could it be that he has in his madness a succession plan, a monarchical, dictatorial, autocratic succession plan uh, for the possibility that he will not be able to finish his term? Thank you, Jay. That goes to the title, What Next? And by the fact that you're raising that possibility that maybe it's not J.D. Vance who's the heir apparent, although he's by constitution, he's the vice president. Um, you raise a really great point, and I'm gonna, uh, Ben, I'm going to throw out a few other names that uh, potential players may fill the administration. Certainly, we'll have Steve Miller back again for a return encore. Uh, remember Michael Flynn? Uh, right. General Michael Flynn? Uh, Steve Bannon, I think, is out of prison as of a couple of days ago or, or yesterday. Yeah. Um, we have, again, JFK Jr. that's been promised some sort of role. Um, the efficiency of agencies, I think, was what um, Donald Trump was initially talking about. We have um, uh, Elon Musk now because of his generous donations. Uh, he'll be a, a member of the cabinet or, or in the wings somewhere. Um, how far does this go? This, this line of um, uh, enablers and the fact that the second term will have no guardrails. You won't have a General Kelly. You won't have a, um, a General Mattis. You won't have a, a General Mark Milley uh, to provide any guardrails. Where does this go with this cast of, should I say, deplorables? Um, right. That was, that was a Hillary Clinton term. Yeah. Uh, but let's go cast with that. Cast of characters. <laughs> yeah, OK. All right. So how far does this go? I, I think, uh, like uh, most presidents, Give, but taking it from an extreme right fascist kind of point of view, that you can always find people who are willing to do his bidding because they want to be close to power. And so there'll be lots of people who will be interested in being that nasty, cruel person that he wants them to be. And so you know, the Bannons and all those and the Elon Musks and all. But I guarantee you that you pick the area of government. There are ambitious people in government. And when they see the wind is blowing one way or another, they will step in line to, to be close to power. Um, my dad used to work in the Foreign Service. He used to say, you know, he worked under six presidents. So sometimes he talked this way, sometimes he talked that way. But everybody to get ahead. Outside of government, I think that, you know, like the late 19th century, you have robber baron essentially types who um, they just want low taxes for themselves. They want uh, deregulation. Uh, they want to essentially have tariffs paid by the poor and middle class, and they want to eliminate the income tax. It's a, basically a, a William McKinley 19th century vision that they want to have. 
And that's how they want to restructure everything in, in government. And there are people who have money and power and influence. So I, you know, I just see a lot of that happening. I also want to say that his foreign policy team is essentially going to be made up of people who are going to be America isolationists. So we're going to leave NATO under him. Uh, we're going to abandon Ukraine under him, which is exactly what Putin wants, of course. And that's one of the reasons why I think that Putin is betting so much on Trump being in place. How is he betting? I think my personal view is that the um, Hamas attack of October 7th, I'm going to say it like that, didn't happen without the nod from Iran, okay? And the nod from Iran did not happen without the nod from Putin, okay? And the idea was to excite the Christian evangelicals uh, who are very strong supporters of Israel and create a whole mess for Biden. I also think that Netanyahu wants to keep this war going. Why? Because he's betting Trump will be in, because Trump won't care about anything that Biden cares about. So he has an interest in keeping that war going. I just heard that North Korea has got troops as well as weapons in Ukraine. Why are they doing that? Because yeah. if we can get rid of NATO and if we can get rid of the U.S. abandoning Ukraine, essentially weakening the American position in the world, I think that North Korea then, and it's just changed its policy, has been focusing on dominating South Korea. And then okay. I think China, Taiwan. I mean, it's it, it's all these pieces. Everybody's got an interest in having Trump be the guy. Okay. I'm going to take the one point you made, and I want to uh, go to Chuck on that. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, mm -hmm. Chuck, uh, Ben just referred to the Robert Barry days, and he referred to policies that previous presidents had. If I'm not mistaken, I think last week Donald Trump referred to one of the ter uh, one of the presidents as a, a, a lover of tariffs against other countries, and he has made a part of his. If there is a platform for Donald Trump, uh, that tariffs is going to be a part of his economic strategy and trade policies. Um, most economists say this is a bad idea. Is Donald Trump living in the past with uh, the good old days where um, you know? Uh, the then oligarchs of our country were, were running the country. Heather Cox Richardson, and probably our most astute commentator on the political context in the context of history of Boston University, laid this out in yesterday's letters from an American. It was President McKinley. Uh, tariffs were kicked up to mid double digits, just really, really super high. Tariffs are paid by the people. They're not paid by foreign countries. They're levied on foreign products to try and favor American product sales. But if the foreign products are purchased, the consumers pay those. Hey, the load on American taxpayers will be huge. It will accelerate, and economists have verified this, it will ac accelerate the insolvency of Social Security by three years from 2034 to 2031. That is exactly Trump's intent. He is doing exactly what Ben and Jay and Professor Richardson have indicated. He is going to concentrate and focus wealth in the few billionaire supporters that he has because that's his only real base of support. He can get people to vote for him, not because he's offering anything that will better their lives, he isn't. And even grassroots Republicans, when interviewed, are now saying, well, we're not voting for the person, we're voting for the policies, and his policies on immigration and the economy are better. Hey, if there's a nicer way to say horseshit, I'm not sure what it is. Horse pucky. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Hey, I have a lot more questions than I have time, so I'm going to go around the table here. The uh, not a real table, the electronic table, and ask for last thoughts and words. Jay, with you. I don't think people realize that when he says this is the last election, 
he means there won't be another one, that he is going to create a dynasty, just as he has denied the, the, the vote in 2020 and will undoubtedly deny the vote in 2024, he and his acolytes will deny all the votes going forward. He will create a dynasty, whether it's J.D. Vance or his son or someone else. He will completely upend our democracy and the peaceful transfer of power, which he says is only love when you get violent about it. Um, the problem I see is that people do not realize um, that there will be no second chance on this. If they vote for him, if this country defines itself as a vote that puts him in power, or if they allow him to take power by hook or crook and get back into the Oval Office, we are all sunk. We are all going off a cliff. He will never, he and his acolytes and successors will never give up power again. And the result will be there is no constitution. There is no rule of law. There's only Mein Kampf. And I don't think they fully understand that. I don't think the press has made that clear. Ben, your last thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm i going to uh, jump off of Jay's comment about the press uh, to say that one of the problems I think we have is what it, I think somebody called it anticipatory obedience. In other words, the press and their sane washing and all that stuff are essentially fearful of not having access if he is in power. And so therefore, they're kind of being softer than they actually should be, okay? Um, and I think that that's one of the problems that we have is that we see, for example, in the Republican Party, a number of people who um, essentially are saying, well, I want to be able to be around to be able to influence the party after Trump, right? The point is, there is no after Trump for the party if Trump is in power. There, there's nothing there. And that's their rationalization to not go all the way to endorsing Kamala. Um, some of them have changed. You saw Kelly here, who's come out this late with something where he's saying something against Trump. But notice... He's not going as far as Liz Cheney saying, I endorse Kamala as far as I know. They all don't go as far as Liz Cheney. And what I love to keep, everyone to keep in mind is that in the Republican Party, there are center-right Republicans and there are extreme-right Republicans. Liz Cheney represents the center-right part of the party that is not seduced by the extreme-right, which is what Trump is, okay? And keep and, the, you know, you can disagree with a lot of things that she does and all that, but her courage and that of the other women, I should say, is really a testament to an, a remarkable kind of way of, of being in this time, because the pressures that are, you see the men, McConnell, Romney, you can pick them all. They just jumping in line because they want to have access to power. And that's unfortunate, but that's the realities of the kind of people that are in those positions. All right. Thank you, Ben. Chuck, you get the last word. I want to bring us back full circle to the private voting booth. Hey. If we can take into that voting booth two images, the image that you painted at the beginning of this session, <clears throat> Trump, his expressions, his words, his actions, his threats, all that stuff. See that image clearly, feel it, feel the force of it, feel the threat of it, feel the danger of it. And then the image of Kamala Harris taking on the best that Fox News can put up against her <clears throat> and literally shredding him calmly, civilly, and with a hint of a smile and a sense of humor at his ignorance and his obstinacy at arguing against the obvious truth. If people can see and feel the obvious truth in that voting booth, we will survive. And if they, they don't, the question is not whether Trump will survive the four years, but whether we will. Because whether it's during his term or at the end of his term, there is going to be 
a huge fight among his chosen few and others who want that power as there was for the House leadership. That's going to happen again. And the system will fall apart All right. because there is no leadership. That's the prospect. Okay, Chuck, thank you. Um, before we conclude, I'm going to tag on to your voting booth uh, comment. And that is, um, I'll go back to Liz Cheney. And that is, uh, vote your conscious vote for Vice President Harris, because no one ever needs to know who you voted for. That's between you and the curtain that envelops you in that voting booth. I'd like to thank my special esteemed guests, Ben Davis, Chuck Crumpton, my co-host, Jay Fidel. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for American Issues Take One. Join us next week, and until then, aloha. Thank you.